We usually don't do it like this, but we do it when we get a guest this big. And guess what? UFOs are going going to the ejection seat tonight, and we're going Bigfooting with my man from Idaho State. Welcome back. I am DJ, the host, and uh, along with the co-creator, co-conspirator, executive producer in fun, interesting, and entertaining, positive talk about what Matt calls the unexplained, the phenomenon, be it Bigfoot, paranormal, UFOs, money, Nathan. What's up, brother? It's great to be here. Uh, I, you know, this morning I started out with the case of the Mondays, but they are <laughs> in the rear view mirror. I am so excited to be here tonight with Dr. Jeff. It's going to be a good one. Can I get an amen? amen. So, <laughs> also uh, with us is uh, the the uh, the paragon of our cab cabby virtue right here. She's an original gangster. She is uh, people who counsels people on how to deal with their problems, especially if you have dealt with the phenomenon. You want to get a hold of Deb of UAP Med. Uh, she is the host of Deb's Data Dojo at a study of UAPs. Deb, what's up, home girl? I'm ready to get scientific up in here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And we brought on the right person to do that. Well, actually, I was chatting with about our guest with uh, Dr. Simeon Hine, who actually had class tonight, or we would have had him on. But it turns out someone in Simeon's family roomed with, with Jeff at like Duke or something. I don't know. We're going to have to put this together. And wow. he went to Stony Brook, which means he's a New Yorker like me. So without further ado, Money, he's a professor of anatomy and anthropology at Idaho State University, where his work on... How do I say this? Vertebrate evolutionary morphology and primate locomotor adaptations and the emergence of human bipedalism party people. Put those hands together for my man, Dr. Jeff Meldrum. Yeah. Hey, man. Ha. Welcome. Pleased to be here. It sounds kind of ostentation. When you say it like that, that's, that's, that's me of the interests and specialties. Yeah, it's kind of kind of obtuse, I guess, for some. But Dude, I love it. I heard you speak at Ocala, Jeff. We got to meet up there, and uh, I loved it. And you know, um, I, I I like to tell the UFO community that you are like uh, the Dr. Gary Nolan uh, of of the Bigfoot community. You bring a sense of legitimacy to the topic that we need. Uh, just like Gary does on the UFO side of the house. You guys are all colleagues. You know, Simeon Hine kind of vacillates between both communities, which is great. And, mm -hmm. um, and so from that standpoint, you know, I, re I really wanted to get your thoughts. And, and especially I, 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 I'd like you to get into a little bit for, for the benefit of our audience, who is not as steeped in Bigfootology, if you will, uh, as much as uh, someone like myself who has dove in headfirst, uh, Nathan, to a slightly lesser degree. Um, the way you've broken down the Patterson Gimlin film, I thought would be interesting. Sure. But before before we get to that, brother, we got to get to something that we have been asking your colleagues, and by me and your colleagues, I mean PhDs that are studying the phenomenon writ large, the unexplained, one one uh, tangent or another, right? Mm -hmm. And we have asked them uh, to talk about what their favorite potato chips are after we saw a trend. So to help us to, to provide, to, uh, to add to this data set, can you please tell us uh, your favorite chips? Are they a salted potato chip, either with ridges or without? Are they a seasoned potato chip, or are you polychip in some way? Oh, my. Well, I, I've reached that stage of life where one has to uh, 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 be very careful about salt intake. So chips are <laughs> really way down on the... Uh, scale. They're they're a rare treat. Um, we indulged in, in a bag of uh, of uh, Doritos, some hot Doritos. I can't remember what flavor it was. Even my wife picked it up. But I, I must say, I you know I search um, uh, long and hard to find uh, <laughs> regular tortilla chips that are 
um, reduced salt that, that you know the the good brands that don't uh, that don't uh, parch your mouth when you stick it because I love salsa and I love guacamole I love mixing all those uh, you know the, the uh, black beans and rice and and guac and sour cream stack it on and then just go at it with a uh, a bowl of chips so Love I'd it. have to say uh, I'd have to say tortilla chips probably. But probably. that's not potato. It's got to oh, be potato based. I thought you just said chips. No. Okay. Well, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm I'm partial to stacks. Quite honestly, <laughs> barbecue flavored stacks. That's my uh, you know go with the sandwich uh, choice. A nice All right. dill pickle okay. spear and and a sandwich and a stack of or a, a handful of of uh, chips because they have they're baked they have less oil so and less salt so anyway i am with uh, you brother so you are you are in this you've skewed the data a little bit from some of your colleagues who were poly chip uh dr gary nolan was a, was a sea salt person like myself uh, uh -huh. but but okay so you've you're a seasoned chip person that's where you're at you yeah. like a seasoned chip like barbecue okay yeah thank you for adding to that and playing along with our ridiculousness uh <laughs> let me let me pass you over to the capable hands of money nathan just one more data point right one more yeah. data point. Well, the world's a better place for it right absolutely, yes, absolutely. answering big questions here yeah um, so uh dr meldrum I, as dj mentioned i think it would be great for our audience uh if we could just have you speak to the patterson gimlin footage a little bit sure. Uh, a lot of our folks just aren't familiar. I, I even talking today to someone about this, and they were like, "I haven't seen that film," which surprises oh, me. You know, wow, not yeah. everyone has seen that film, but yeah. there are some who just aren't as familiar with it. So, what I wanted to do, I'll just put it up on screen real quick. It's a, a short clip. I actually, slowed it down just a little because I think it's a little easier to to think about mm -hmm. slow. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna put it up, and, uh, and maybe you can kind of walk us through this just just okay. a little bit here. So hold on one sure. second. Well, this is this is shot in Northern California, back in 1967, at a time when, you know, much of Northern California was extremely wild. It still is. There's a few, you know, paved highways that uh, crisscross that end of the state. But uh, Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin had gone down there uh, in uh, in follow up to a report of some exceptional footprints. Uh, one of which I'm. I'm inclined to think is actually her footprints, this individual. And uh, she was, appeared to be in company with two um, smaller individuals, one with a 13 inch foot and one with an 11 inch foot. And um, the 11 inch one isn't as well documented. And there, there have been some that have suggested that might have actually been one of the loggers who took their boot off and sock off to step next to the footprint uh, for a scale, but, uh, in any case, uh, they were down there and as you can see, they, they, uh, struck gold when it came, uh, to that, uh, that Friday and, um, uh, they went up a particular Creek and as they came around a bend in the Creek, there was a big crow's nest, a big root wad. There was, as you can see, all the debris that's littering the, uh, the scoured Creek bottom the valley there uh as a result of seasonal floods and there had been some real severe flooding so a lot of debris and uh that probably that and the and the um, sound of the creek babbling down through its bed and, and perhaps you know the direction of the wind the creature didn't um wasn't apparently aware of their approach and as they emerged around that big crow's nest uh off to their left, standing much closer than you see it here even, uh, was this creature on the, the creek bed, uh, the sandbar. The creek had kind of cut down through the sandbar, and so it was recessed about three feet. And um, the horses got smell of it and reared, and Roger's horse fell on its side. He uh, very nimbly, he'd actually practiced extricating his camera from the saddlebag he kept one of the one of the buckles on the saddlebag open so that he could reach right in and pull it out and went running across the creek filming as he ran so the first part that precedes this clip that you showed uh the image is gyrating wildly as rogers running across the creek you catch a couple of glimpses of it as the camera uh, lens passes over but then he literally 
you know, you can imagine with one eye closed, the other eye just up against this little viewfinder, which makes everything look very small, quite honestly. He ran uh, right headlong into that three foot tall sandbar, the bank there, and it knocked him to his knees, dropped him to his knees, which was good because then he could stable. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And he had that, uh, that very iconic pan uh, to stage right as the creature um, walked across uh, behind the debris, obscured by the debris. At one point, he got up and changed positions when the uh, intervening trees was were obscuring his view. And he got a really interesting parting shot as it makes its way up the up, upstream. And you can see the whole back profile, this massive broad shoulders and, and traps uh, that are coming up high on the head. And, and um, a very interesting aspect to the gate. You can actually see how as it lifts each foot, it turns the foot out a little bit. Yeah. And uh, I think that's an, just an adaptation to the relatively longer foot. I mean, longer relative to uh, leg length that we see you know it kind of reminds me of when you try to walk on the beach uh, down the beach into the water with swim fins on and you have to kind of high step and turn your foot out a little bit or else you know it's easier yes. to turn around and walk backwards but you know so the the skeptic would say oh well yeah that's because he's wearing these big clown feet so he has to walk like he's wearing flippers uh the whoever's in the costume but no i think it's i think it's part of the i mean the adaptation it doesn't look unnatural in, in the least. It doesn't look awkward uh, or, uh, or or ungainly. I mean, it just it's a smooth, um, seamless gait that is so, you know, correlated with the rest of the anatomy. So, not, anyway, uh, mm -hmm. I was going to say not to mention no one on planet Earth would have made it a female if they were trying to create a monster suit. No one would have said, "Hey, you know what? Let's add mammary glands for the hell yeah. of it." Well, the, the, the devil's advocate would say it's hard, you know, a, a male Sasquatch is allegedly anywhere from seven to eight or nine feet tall. Hard to find someone to fit a suit, hard to find a suit that's made for someone that, of that stature. And so if you're going to put a man, uh, uh, you know, a six foot man or a six and a half foot man into a suit, even, even to find a suit for a six and a half foot man would be, uh, would be problematic. But what you would do then is that would be a female Sasquatch, smaller height, right? And the reports, which Patterson had, uh, had depicted in his book, the reports, uh, namely the Ostman abduction report Robert Ostman. Mm -hmm. and the William Rowe uh, encounter, which is just an iconic, classic, daytime, uh, very uh, careful observation. Uh, both made mention of uh, pendulous breasts. And so, you know, I mean, it would, would have taken some uh, clever reverse engineering. Now to flip back to the, 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 the protagonist side. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, Bill, Mun well, first of all, let, let's, uh, Philip Morris, the, the uh, supposed costume maker, uh, didn't have a costume in stock with, <laughs> with the, uh, uh, breasts. In fact, all of his costumes have the bare-chested, gorilla-like uh, uh, anatomy. And so when when they were challenged, he and, and Bob Hieronymus, who claimed to uh, one of the claimants mm -hmm. in the suit, to having been in the suit, um, Morris kind of reverse-engineered and, and uh, attached hairy breasts to one of his costumes. And I mean, it looks ridiculous. It just looks looks really silly. But more fascinating from an anatomical point of view is, is the study that uh, Bill Munns, and I, I helped in a small way, helped to facilitate the funding of it. Uh, that was significant. I didn't be, I wasn't able to participate directly in the, the research. But with the, um, there, there's this really interesting little segment of the film where, um, you know how if you're walking down the sidewalk and, and by chance, one of the squares of the cement is a little bit, you know, it could only be a quarter of an inch lower, but it's lower than you expect, than you anticipate. And so instead of reaching the cement as you step, you have an extra quarter, half inch, 
and it gives you that jolting jar that rattles your spine and brain <laughs> well mm -hmm. there's there's a spot in the film where that happens to patty as she's walking on the sandbar and you can see that jolt and the shock wave travels literally up her leg through that soft tissue all the way up until it hits the breast and the breast compresses expands laterally and then rebounds back to its original shape in, an, in a remarkably natural way. Now, Bill Munns poses that if faced with the prospect of creating these breasts, lifelike breasts on this costume, there were only so many options open to uh, a costume designer. You could just fill it with fluff, and then it would certainly wouldn't behave with any weight or inertia. Or you could, as was commonly done, you could fill it with something like rice or a grain or pellets, you know, BBs. Um, or you could use um, some kind of, a, you know, polystyrene or something, a, a, an expansion foam just to fill that would, could be sculpted and fill the, the, uh, the space. Or you could use water balloons. And that, you know, the latter would be the most likely. But even that, that's almost too much weight. Right. Um, too much uh, sloshing around that. Uh, so uh, he actually, we, we've published a study together um, using um, models, human, human subject models, to demonstrate that that dynamic, that action of the compression of the breast tissue with the jolt. He d devised an apparatus that would, uh, when you'd stand on it, then pull the, the release it would drop a quarter of an inch, just enough to create that little bit of shock wave. And then with high speed film, actually document that that compression, that shock wave going up through the through the torso and the compression of the breast tissue and made comparisons to other different attempts to fabricate breast tissue. And, you know, there's no comparison. I mean, it's just nothing. Even the water bullets, it just doesn't it doesn't uh, compare. So that's published, by the way, in the Relic Hominoid Inquiry which is an online journal, I'll put a plug in for it here, an online journal that, uh, that I edit with the assistance of a, of a full editorial board. Uh, we're in about the 12th year of publishing um, uh, academic peer-reviewed articles. And this was one study that, that uh, was included in uh, the content. What was the other individual you said? I want to look up uh, beyond uh, Albert Osman, the other one you said. William Rowe. The, the sighting, yeah, okay. William Rowe, and this is one of those early, and, and, and it's a fascinating description because it was so early. You know, these days there's so much portrayed on uh, cable television and on the internet, social media. There's so many. I mean, now it's the all the AI generated uh, concoctions of what Sasquatch or Bigfoot might look like, but uh, but the uh, image that people have is is readily uh, accessible uh, back in in the 1940s and 50s, you know, there was no pattern for a, a person like William Rowe to describe a creature that is yet still so remarkably similar to what eyewitnesses are seeing today and what we see on the Patterson Gimlin film. You know, I, I so I find those pre-internet uh, descriptions to be very compelling. Um, because they just, you know, they weren't comparing notes. <laughs> right. Copying off of something they heard on a podcast and say, yeah. I'm going to fashion my story a lot like that. I, yeah. I totally get that. I and, just want to ask. Uh, I was just going to add, and even, and the other pitfall is that even sincere witnesses, um, they can have a preconception. And if they saw something, even if it's a glimpse, their brain already has this template in their, in mind. And it's easy to fill in the gaps to, to recall details that were never observed, but that were already planted in, in one's mind and the brain just readily gloms onto that to fill in the gaps, to create an expected narrative that makes sense. And that, that does make sense in total. Um, I want to ask from a behavioral standpoint, did you get, you know, she was bending down having a drink, I think is what those guys thought. Did, from from a primate behavioral standpoint, um, do you do you glean anything that she didn't bring young ones down there to to the water line with her, or that she was by herself? Does that 
trigger anything yeah. for you? Well, yeah, there's there's several possibilities, and, and we're kind of you know we're getting out on the on the branch a little bit here, but sure. but the fact that she seemed to have been in, in company, if 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 my inclination is correct, that those those tracks that were documented the month prior were hers, included hers, then she had some um, presumably some dependent or or um, or otherwise offspring with her um, <clears throat> and it's even been suggested that she might have recently given birth if you notice there on that image she has a little bit of a of a lap over her waist mm -hmm. which uh, the critics argue is you know it's a, a belt cinched with the costume shirt hanging over the edge but it just goes around perfectly to the side of the midriff which is how the excessive belly skin postpartum immediately following childbirth would um, would appear also the breasts are very prominent they're not always described as prominent in um, in eyewitness accounts i mean it strikes me that she could be lactating that could mm -hmm. be postpartum engorgement even of of the breasts and that she has recently given birth which might be why there were some young uh, or dependent offspring with her or uh you know even if they weren't not were not entirely dependent they were there to uh lend assistance it's got the midwifery kind of model in other words and it's been suggested that her behavior of walking through this open uh stretch of the creek bed in full view of these men on horseback when she could have uh, you know, made a beeline to that tree line and gone up that. I mean, she's quite capable of scaling up that steep mountain slope through that brush and, and uh, deadfall. Um, but instead, she seems to attempt to lead them down the um, down the path there. And it's many have, have suggested that it's the, uh, you know, the broken bird wing um, model where they're, she's trying to lead them away from her offspring maybe the wow. infant is you know uh sequestered with one of these uh sub adults somewhere now those who visited the site you know but, but in addition to roger and bob they they only witnessed uh one set of footprints and others like um bob titmus obviously uh, is an ex uh, excellent tracker and uh, studied the area very very carefully after shortly afterward uh, about a, less than, well, a little more than a week about 10 days mm -hmm. less than two weeks and he said there was no sign of any other footprints so if they were there she must have been separated from them some distance uh it's not like they were just hiding down behind the, the right. wall okay. of the immediate side but but those are you know interesting angles that uh, aren't out of the realm of possibility uh, I mean, what, what is important to me is the fact that whatever transpired was very spontaneous and was, um, uh, you know, a, a, a one, one take, <laughs> one right. shot. Uh, you know, because you can imagine if somebody, you know, they, tr they stumble, they, they say, oh, well, let me do that one more time. And, of course, <laughs> all that would leave a record on right. the um, I had the opportunity to visit with uh, Lyle Laverty. Lyle was a timber cruiser at the time, had a, a summer crew. They were marking some of the timber for salvage uh, because of all that down timber as a result of the flood. They were working in that area. They were in town for the weekend. They'd already left you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday they were in, in Willow Creek, uh, just you know, doing their business. And, and uh, but they got wind of the um the brouhaha over this film and uh, heard heard stories told about it and said uh, I, I he didn't um, meet up with uh, roger and bob to my knowledge but he he uh, in discussing with his crew he said that's really close to where we were camped before and so they went back and sure enough they found um the film site and um, Lyle uh, photographed uh, with uh, color slides uh, a number of the footprints. 
And he went on through the Forest Service, became number two in the Forest Service. Eventually, he, when he retired, he was the director of, uh, of parks in uh, the state of Colorado. I had a chance to talk to him over the phone, and, and that was the first question I asked him. I said, well, when you arrived and looked, I mean, what did you see? What, what was your impression? And, you know, he described how the, the footprints were deeply impressed in that, in that uh, slaty, sandy um, uh, bank. And there were horse hoof prints all over, cowboy boots, where clearly they had gone all over the place examining and, and filming the tracks. And, and then he said there was evidence of, of the plaster casting of the footprints. And I said, well, was there anything to suggest other than what was described? I mean, what you've just described, I mean, was there any evidence of, of circling back and repeat um, uh, sets of footprints? And he said, no, no, it was just all very, just linear. that described. Yeah, one linear event. And uh, that, that was, I think, really significant. The fact that, he, and, and, and the, then the, uh, the tracks that he photographed included a number of the tracks that Bob Titmus cast when he came down 10 days after the fact, he cast 10 footprints uh, in succession, regardless of their quality. Whereas Roger had looked for the cleanest, clearest right and left, so, so clean and clear and flat that when they were examined by the experts, they looked like carved, like they'd been made by carved wooden planks. Wood, right. They were flat, they were featureless, you know, and they were expecting contours of an arch and, and differential pressure under the heel and the ball of the foot. And that wasn't present. And so that made them, because again, they were expecting a certain appearance that when it didn't fit that expectation, they dismissed it as a hoax. So Titmus did a great service. And that when combined with the confirmation of the photos by Lyle Laverty in his testimony, just really, I mean, it's a well-documented um, uh, piece of evidence, so much so that when I kind of went out on the limb <clears throat> and bucked, bucked the uh, guidelines just a little bit, <laughs> and uh, there's, there's a system of nomenclature called ichnotaxonomy, which is applying the scientific name to uh, fossilized tracks or traces, uh, sign of the track maker where the track maker's bones have not yet been found. So in other words, it's a means to catalog footprints and, and, uh, and, and other kinds of traces, uh, dens and burrows and so forth, but pr primarily footprints of animals uh, that we don't know really what the, what the track maker is, but we want to have a, a handle, a label as that, to which we can attach a diagnosis. A different a description and differential diagnosis how do these differ from other tracks and, and it allows you to study and compare and analyze these well we have here a case not fossilized and there are there's some some uh, curmudgeons who uh, who have made a big deal about that I, I get such a kick out of some of these skeptics you know they'll yeah. they'll rake you over the coals because you have you have violated the uh, the guideline but will they actually engage the footprints will they actually criticize the footprints no i mean other than to then to pronounce them hoax but but um so we, we we've got the um the situation where we have these tracks but we don't have the um track maker yet acknowledged or recognized i mean we suspect obviously don't we but in the case uh, of the Patterson Gimlin film, I mean, this we we do have this kind of uh, validation or corroboration. Let's put it that way: corroboration of of the footprints, well documented um, casts, uh, molds of which now reside in the Smithsonian's special collections of the Department of Anthropology. So, and the other, the original casts of Bob Titmus are accessioned in the Willow Creek China Flats Museum which is a certified uh, accredited museum. And so, uh, so that, uh, that uh, criteria was met by that fact. And then I, I floated this idea. I was encouraged by a couple of, 
of uh, colleagues who are um, uh, very uh, renowned in circles, uh, the ichnotaxonomy uh, or ichnology, the study of fossilized traces. And, um, and they encouraged me to go ahead and, and give this a shot. And uh, so I described it and presented it at a symposium, a special uh, conference at the um, uh, New Mexico Museum of Natural History. It was a special conference on Cenozoic tracks and traces. So the tracks and traces of, of particularly mammals, but also birds and reptiles and so forth um, that uh, uh, have, have gone extinct during the last era. And, um, you know, to a room of 75 plus world experts, you know, international representation, world experts on the interpretation of fossilized tracks and traces of, of uh, every type of mammal you can imagine. And, and uh, to, to tremendous um, interest and support and enthusiasm. I mean, there was one curmudgeon and he kept making these really silly, silly uh quips and comments about it until finally the other members of the audience told him to sit down and, and, <laughs> and quit quit spouting off. but i i had brought a sampling of of uh, actual cast there's something about holding and examining a physical cast that's that is a totally different experience than seeing something up on the uh, uh, projected screen or even in a book or a television and uh, so they had the opportunity to do that as well as a result of the conversation discussion that ensued thereafter, um, uh, I was invited to submit a manuscript for publication in the uh, bulletin of the um, of the uh, New Mexico Museum of Natural History, the proceedings of this symposium, and it was reviewed by five reviewers, not two and not three, but five, who all came down very f positively. Um, gave it a thumbs up and so it is published and you know so it um it i think it, it it demonstrates very well how the evidence of the patterson gimlin film stands up under scrutiny i mean i've often said if i only had the footprints documented at that film site and didn't even have the film to look at i'd be convinced of the credibility of of bob and roger's encounter I, I heard, yeah. I heard you say that. But even hey, what's up, man? What's up, Tim? <laughs> Welcome, brother. Um, but even you know that w w what you talked about with the traps and the muscles in the back moving. I don't know if it was M.K. Davis's version. There's a couple versions out there where where you can see it quite close. Yeah. I don't believe in 1967 you could have made a suit. First of all, that has, that sort of musculature is very, very uncommon. Okay, you're, yeah. you 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 would probably have to go all over Los Angeles and see if you could find one person that had traps that rose off oh, of those yeah. shoulders into the yeah. back of the neck. And now to have that musculature moving in a dynamic fashion, even yeah. 13 years later, George Lucas with Chewbacca doesn't look oh, yeah. anything like this. Nothing. No, no, no. And Chewbacca with its long hair, I mean, that's the strategy of the costume. Sure, uh, to uh, hide designer. it. To hide it, yeah, to hide it. You know, they uh, even, um, even uh, oh, the Grinch, the Grinch's costume. But, you know, the worst thing is the neck, because if you cover the neck, then every time we have a very movable head and our neck has a, a range of motion, which will throw any kind of fabric up into unnatural looking folds. And so uh, for for the Grinch, they just made it collarless, a neckless costume that bl was blended in here below, painted the skin green. And then he had chin whiskers that hung down. Which was the same thing they did for you know Chewbacca with yeah. Chewbacca and uh, the Bigfoot on uh, the Six Million Dollar Man. They had a, he had a big thick beard that covered up the neck. <laughs> it's just and still it's so funny if you if you're a connoisseur of, of these uh, appearances of Bigfoot on the on the screen uh, when the when the bionic Bigfoot then, uh, goes bouncing down the hill rolling with uh, wrestling with with Lee Majors. His shirt comes up at one point. <laughs> he closes his back, and they didn't edit it out. I couldn't believe it. You know, it uh, it was pretty hilarious. 
And of course, then you can see the bottom of the feet too and how, how ridiculously contrived they were. But no, this is the thing that people forget because we've got a, you know, a whole generation that uh, were born much later than 1967. But in 1967, there was no four-way stretch fur. There was just fur cloth. And it was like, you know, hairy cloth that, that didn't have any give to it. And so to, to get it to fit, it's not like pulling on yoga pants. You know, it's, it, it's like pulling on trousers that'll have straight edges and will have folds and creases and, and uh, that doesn't conform unless you go to great lengths to tailor it to your specific actor. Now, I, I always had a, uh, got a kick out of, uh, there was a British producer uh, by the name of Chris Packham who really thought he was going to make a splash and make a name, make a mark by debunking the Patterson-Gimlin film. And so there's this scene on, in his documentary where he actually, he's consulting with some, some of the members of uh, Jim Henson's Creature Shop. And uh, so these guys sh should be in the know but uh, so they're they're in in the studio and they're looking at the Patterson Gimlin film on a monitor and then I don't know uh, it wasn't Jim Henson it was one of his uh, of his proteges I guess and I can't think of his name now but he says oh yes you know this is obviously a costume and here's how we do it and the camera pans <laughs> and here's the actor donning a modern costume with four way stretch fur but first he's pulling on a spandex undergarment that has sewn into it sculpted foam rubber musculature well now wait a minute they didn't have foam rubber readily available in 1967 that's a fairly recent innovation you couldn't go down to kmart and buy a foam mattress you know for your in-laws to sleep on when they come to visit <laughs> they uh you know they were just beginning to experiment with injected foam rubber in hollywood when um you know, John Chambers introduced this pioneering special effect of these molded facial appliances for Planet of the Apes. That, and he got that won him an honorary Oscar. They didn't actually have an Oscar in, in that category, but they, you know, at that time, but they, they gave him an acknowledgement for that remarkable. And then, yeah, look at the, look at the result. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, not only the face, but then you had these uh, pencil necks, big right. heads on a pencil neck, which they covered up with a high uh, leather collar on their tunic to hide the neck, you know, and and costumes. I was uh, point people to the the sauna. I think it's in the second in the second one uh, beneath the Planet of the Apes when mm -hmm. um, when they're having their little conference in the sauna, and in come these apes with a towel around their waist. And nothing else and they look like big hairy pillsbury doughboys you know whereas <laughs> when they go out with their regular costume on they look like they're very you know very yeah. uh yeah <laughs> yeah it's it's pretty absurd they, they try to uh do we have the same uh, we have people in the ufo community trying to debunk uh multiple mm -hmm. fighter pilots uh, and a radar op and multiple radar operators that saw the tic tac. So you have people yeah. they're going to try to debunk no matter how good the evidence is. They're going to go this is fake, and then you're going to go. You really sound like an idiot, but that's yeah. okay. Um, let me. I got to turn you over to Debs because we got to get a couple, couple people in here so I don't sure. use up all the oxygen in the room. Debs, so uh, what do you have for Doctor Meldrum, ma'am? Right. So I actually got Hi, to Tim. see. Hi, <laughs> I got to see a really interesting um, analysis of the video and they pointed out some other things about the fur and where it's matted. And they also spoke about the facial features and what that might indicate about what kind of um, being this is. So I was wondering if you could speak to that. Yeah, there's been a, a couple of different remarks. If, if this is the one you're referring to about matted fur on the backside uh, in, in the area of the buttock, and there have been all sorts of speculation about it. The best imagery, the best, um, uh, uh, most optimized images, shows a very normal contour of the buttocks. In fact, I mean, there's there in the in the initial segment that rarely gets shown on television because it's right in the middle of this uh, gyrating uh, camera. Uh, sequence there's a point where the camera passes right over the lens is perfectly lined up with the subject 
and there's one frame that just jumps out because it's really in focus. And it, well, I mean, the whole thing's in focus. I, I don't mean when you say that, it's, there's minimal uh, motion blur in that instant. The only, the only blurriness about the film is motion blur of the camera movement um, because it's, it's a fixed focal length lens. It's not like he was required to focus on the image. Everything from two feet in front of the camera to infinity is in focus. You, the thing what what people interpret as being blurry is the graininess of extreme enlargement of uh, a film a uh, portion of the film frame which is itself only 16 by 16 millimeters and uh, the subject on that that we're blowing up is 1.8 millimeters tall so you can imagine I mean people today don't understand grain it, it would be analogous, although different, than pixels. And if you enlarge a low-resolution image too much, it becomes pixelated, right? Well, grain uh, describes the little photographically uh, you know, light-sensitive crystals on the film uh, emulsion that's, that when exposed to light then and developed, um, you know, captures the image. If you increase the enlargement, you start to see the individual discrete crystals. And uh, it actually was the best film that he could have chosen at that time. And so you're able to blow it up and look at something like this. I mean, I have, when, when I was a youngster, I uh, and first saw the film uh, shown in Spokane, I immediately joined the Northwest Research Association which was Roger's organization and the membership uh, dues uh, and purchase of, of uh, uh, photographic prints and casts helped to, well, hoped, it was hoped it would generate a revenue stream that would finance his search for the creature. Um, I purchased a five by seven, uh, or membership brought a five by seven color print that was a very early print uh, for directly from the film, presumably, because you know the 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 uh, the quality of the image is just astounding. I mean, most people who see this on television, they see a licensed VHS copy of a copy that Mrs. Patterson makes available, and it's extremely deter. I mean, it's fifty years old now, old, yeah. deteriorating, and it's uh, all washed out and it's scratched. You know, not the not the videotape, but the film, the copy that it's made from, which the producers of the documentaries don't mind. I mean, it gives it that campy look, you know, that uh, uh, adds a little mystique to it. But the point is, it's it's actually remarkably in focus. All right, I got off track. So when you when you look at this one isolated image, you get a, a really and, and, and the subject is still fairly close because it was right on the edge of the creek. And Roger has run full tilt across the creek, taking his sh shooting as he's going, and uh, you can see the the uh, the buttocks, the booty, really well. Uh, the definition of the cheeks and the cleft, and there's no matted feces, there's no matted hair, there's nothing there. It's just the shadow. And then, uh, often misinterpreted, the left hand as it swings back becomes partially visible, just to the side. And below, because of these very long arms, below the buttock, uh, the, the, the gluteal fold there underneath the buttock. Now, some have even, the, the hand is so enormous that, <laughs> that uh, M.K. Davis has argued that it's holding something. It has, a, it has a leather pouch or a satchel or something in its hand that it's carrying. And it's not. It's the hand. It's simply the, the large palm of the of the hand and it swings you know, with the arm just as you would expect the facial features again uh many people are laboring under the misconception that you can't see anything um uh you know and there's one frame that has made the rounds and the, the history and its origin is still kind of in the mists of uncertainty as to who did it or what it but it's it was one of these um prints but it had been doctored whether it had been you know manually uh enhanced or or uh, redrawn or later a digital image had been had been altered 
it shows too much detail. It's the one that has the big everted lips and uh, the broad, very broad, flattened nose. Um, those details are not, well, those details aren't borne out in any other frame of the film or and, and the, the better versions of the film. It has a pretty lipless smile. In fact, the mouth is lower than where most people place it. And the upper lip, at one point, she's, um, she's got a, a pout where the, the, lip, the lips are clenched and the upper lip, very muscular, is kind of bulging out like you see a chimpanzee do sometimes when they press their lips together. You can, uh, everyone always, I mean, I had the, the most uh, the novel comment, someone recently said to me, why is she wearing a mask like a ninja? Because <laughs> they, they thought that this highlight here uh, and on the side of the nose and down around the underside of the eye was, um, was, the, act, was the face that everything below that was darker was you know underneath a ninja um, mask and and then others say well th these these areas here are cut out you know Hieronymus described that the head was created on top of a football helmet <laughs> and that yeah that the face was built up in front so I mean you know he said that the eye hole yeah and Hieronymus only had one eye he had a, a glass eye a, a false eye that he said he took out and stuck into some clay on the outside so that it would catch the light and give it a more realistic look. <laughs> and and that he, with his other eye, he said the opening to the actual, in the mask was a good two inches away from his eye. Now imagine you're out there. <laughs> you can't see anything. Oversized feet and you, you close one eye and you put a toilet paper roll up against your other eye. And that's the only way you can see now you don't see any of that. Uh, she she walks as as beautifully. beautifully and smoothly. She never looks down at the ground to see where she's placing her feet. I mean, she she just has a, a sense of of space, <laughs> a sense of of surrounding. <clears throat> and and as someone who likes to barefoot hike, uh, you better be looking at the ground because you could step on some things. Well, sure. uh, that you don't want to step on. And by the way, I'll send you some photos of tracks that I picked up that I'm not, oh. I'm not sure about, but I need to get Tim seen them. Uh, but anyway, let's get Nathan in there. Then we'll get Tim. And then uh, I've got a, a question I, to ask you that I think might be interesting. Something Tim and I have been discussing, but go ahead. Money, right. Nathan, please. Sure. So um, I'm sure uh, Dr. Meldrum, you're familiar with uh, the recent, uh, kind of discovery of Homo Naledi, uh, I think Lee, yeah. Lee Berger. And, you know, yeah. we're, we're kind of at a time period now where we're re-examining our human history. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on where you think this is uh, going, if you could speculate a little bit as we, you know, rediscover parts of our past that, that we maybe ignored or uh, di didn't want to look too closely at for fear of what it might tell us. Well, I think it's just, it's, it's uh, been... Uh, we, we've experienced a paradigm shift in anthropology. And uh, when, when I was a student, we were coming off, just off of it, off of a, a prior paradigm, which was labeled um, the single species hypothesis. You know, I, I often wondered why, why was there this almost irrational, well, it was irrational. A lot of the comments that were made were irrational by the critics, uh, those who criticized the Patterson Gimlin film it just said things that in even at the time should have been recognized as irrational but now in hindsight are just embarrassing for my discipline that the experts that were tapped to evaluate this thing made these ridiculous pronouncements like well I mean just for example um, the 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 one uh, I can't remember who who to give this credit to now but he said isn't this silly um, They've uh, gone to the effort of, of uh, uh, endowing our, this costume with female breasts, but the creature walks like a man. It's obviously a man in a fursuit. Well, now, wait a minute. You know, obviously humans walk different, male versus female, on average. Why is that? Because females typically have a larger birth canal, a wider pelvis that separates the hip 
and increases the valgus angle of the thighs, bringing the knees in towards the, the midline. And so when they walk, there's a greater tendency for listing of the pelvis, okay? This creature, if it exists, has a brain that is proportionate to its body size, uh, similar to that of, a, of an ape, of a gorilla or a chimpanzee. And as such, does not have the obstetric constraints of childbirth, of, of you know, giving birth to a large-brained infant. And so the hips would not be wider in a female Sasquatch versus a male Sasquatch. Ergo, a female Sasquatch walks like a male Sasquatch, essentially. <laughs> I mean, obviously, there's other uh, mass distribution issues that might come into play. Um, uh, but nevertheless, when it comes to the hips, they're going to be very, very similar. I mean, that, that kind of thing. So anyway, I'm sorry, I got off on that, that path. You were asking about, remind me again. Oh, the, no, the paradigm shift. Yes. So, so my, my react, my question was, why was there such a visceral reaction, a rejection? Well, back in the sixties, it was at the heyday in the sixties, um, Physical anthropology was still kind of coming into its own as a as a reputable hard science discipline of anthropology uh, and uh, defining itself and it uh, as do as is the case with many fledgling disciplines they look to other disciplines for um, axioms that can be incorporated and one of those was the uh, uh, competitive exclusion principle, which started off back in the 30s with microbiologists who recognized that two species couldn't grow in the same uh, medium. One would do it better than the other and drive the one to extinction. So one species, one species, one niche, niche. Well, ecology with its central niche hypothesis, niche concept, glommed onto that competitive exclusion principle and that defined the ecological niche, one species, one niche. Well, anthropologists said, well, the hominin niche defined by bipedalism, braininess, and above all culture, that's a pretty exclusive club. So there can be only one species in it at any given time. So human evolution was perceived as this and narrated <laughs> the narrative that took shape as a single file march, one species giving rise to its successor, you know, either in fits and starts or in gradual um, changing uh, ev evolution. But there could be only one. So in 1967, or go back, in 1962, Ivan Sanderson published his huge tome, his encyclopedic tome, Abominable Snowman, Legend Come to Life. Um, subtitle was Subhuman Species on Five Continents. You know, he, he brought in the notion of neo-giants, Sasquatch-like creatures, sa uh, distinguishing them from the Yeti and from the Russian Almas and from the little people, the Orang Pendex of Southeast Asia. Okay. Presents this to the scientific community. I mean, this was intended to be a scientific treatment. And they go, it's just, it's just fairy tales, you know. There, there, there is no, there is only one species in that niche, and we're it. So there, these things can't exist. So in Roger Patterson, 1967, it's still that's the paradigm. So when you suggest, you know, they see this thing walk across the, uh, the screen, and it stands upright. It's bipedal like us, like a like a hominin. Well, that can't be. It can't exist. Therefore, it. There must it must be hoaxed. So let's see what what rationale can we give to defend that <laughs> edict? And they made up these ridiculous things. John Green, um, sorry, John Napier was a primatologist who was on the panel at the Smithsonian viewing the Patterson film, Patterson Gilman film. Um, uh, Napier's specialty was primate locomotion. He he was a, actually a physician before becoming an academician, uh, you know, had his MD as well as his PhD, and was a hand and foot specialist. And, uh, you know, so he was very, very qualified to 
evaluate this, and he came thumbs down. But in his book, which he, he wrote eventually, shortly thereafter, over the next several years, he said he was at least forthright enough to say, you know, I really can't justify that conclusion, except when I look at what I at, at what's on the screen there, from the waist up, it looks like a ape. From the waist down, it looks like a human. <laughs> I can't imagine that hybrid of structure existing in nature. It must be a hoax, a fabrication. Well, his book came out in 1972. Later in that decade, kind of a, it's often labeled as the golden era of paleoanthropology, uh, Don Johansson and Lucy came on the stage. Australopithecus afarensis, for the first time they had cranial remains associated with postcranial skeletal remains, including a pelvis and knees and ankles. And how did they describe this interesting new species to the popular press? From the waist up, she looks just like a chimpanzee. From the waist down, she looks like a human. Well, now, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, that was the linchpin in Napier's argument for rejecting the film. What if he had waited another five years before he finished his book and published it? Well, I wonder what his, you know, he died not too long after retirement, but I, um, I wonder what, what difference. So then there was this shift. So all of a sudden now, I mean, not, first of all, not only was, was there more awareness about unusual, unexpected combinations of traits, which had been presaged by the Patterson-Gimlin film, sometimes by decades, but we had this burgeoning discovery, this plethora of hominins that you couldn't squeeze onto a single line. And so suddenly now we've got a bushy family tree with lots of species coexisting across uh, the, the landscape at different times. And we have evidence of many of these lineages persisting like Homo naladi uh, until remarkably recent times. I mean, we have Neanderthal sites that possibly could be as young as 10,000 years, if not if not into the present. We've got Homo heidelbergensis in, in um, uh, East Asia above Beijing that's been dated to about 20,000 years. We have the possibility of Homo erectus. So some of these dates are, this this one is a, is a little bit contested, but uh, possibly as recent as 25,000. Some have pushed it back to as much as 70,000. But so what? 70,000 years. I mean, they were living alongside Homo sapiens. Uh, and so, you know, you jump in a time machine and go back 30,000 years, get out in East Asia and walk around. You might bump into any of one of any one of as many as six or seven or eight species of bipedal hominid. So it's just uh, that that's been the biggest change, I think. And so it's not, you know, it's um, th th there's always um, individuals who are very close minded, very parochial in their thinking. Uh, but this is even more profound, more, more. Um, uh, what's the word I'm after? It's, it's more, um, I mean, it's institutional. It's not the individual, it's, it's institutional. And a whole generation has had to kind of pass. You know, I, I get approached by students now, uh, anthropology <laughs> students and recent graduates who are really excited about this topic. And they're not completely um, uh, indoctrinated in this notion of a single species hypothesis. They are, you know, now more open to the possibility that that, that some of these lineages have persisted into recent times. And, and why, why, why would we reject that hypothesis? You know, this arrogant notion that if it was out, it's like one of my previous department chairs, who, <laughs> you know, his, his retort to me was, I was born and raised in Idaho. I've hunted and fished all across this state. If it was out there, I'd have seen it by now. Sure. Wow. That's, that's a real high opinion. Of your, yeah. Wow. Case your, closed. Your, of observation. The case closed. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's a little bit and uncomfortable. Here's... I think that's the issue, right? It's uncomfortable yeah. for people to, to imagine just what you stated earlier that there, at one point in time, we occupied this planet with sister species, brother, sister species. Yeah. It's something that we can't really wrap our 
minds around because sure. we treat the other animals around us as you know sort of as lesser than uh, right. so it really kind of confronts some of our biases in many ways right well and and when people raise that uh, that contention you know one of my comments i said well you know if if they're especially if, if they're speaking from the position of of of, of a faith uh, conviction, um, and, and they they may think that um, acknowledging, and I've had people say this, acknowledging the existence of Bigfoot would question our own um, special place in creation. And I and my response is, well, you know, does the existence of a gorilla threaten your faith? <laughs> you know, they I mean, didn't believe in that either. <laughs> this is just a, yeah, this is just a gorilla that stands on its hind legs, but. It's it's uh, in this case now you know if if they if they discover an almas and it's an it's a relic Neanderthal now that's going to be a different uh, <laughs> be a stickier wicket because of the remarkable affinity and and the flow you know the introgression of Neanderthal genes in the in um, the human genome so. Hey, Jeff, uh, one, th one thing I was going to say about the skeptics is what happens when you bring them like one of these prints where it's really obvious about the mid-tarsal break, and then you go, does the human's foot bend there? Do you think our foot bends there? I mean, like, <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, the easiest argument is, uh, is to kind of, uh, I guess, just profess uh, ignorance and, and say that my interpretation is wrong, that it's just, it's still, well, and, and there have been those. Um, uh, what's his name? Crowley. Matthew Crowley has done some of the most um, publicized work where he, he actually modeled some um, fake feet out of uh, latex rubber and had them mounted to shoes that he could wear and, and then walk on sand. And he, uh, he published photos that he said showed how he produced a mid-tarsal pressure ridge with these fake feet. But the, the ridge, it's not consistent from one step to the other. It's, you know, because it's not being dictated by an articulation in the skeleton of the foot. It's by the deforma the deformation of this, uh, this squishy um, uh, foot, semi-rigid rubber foot. I mean, it's just, there's a total misunderstanding on his part. And, and, and I wouldn't expect him to understand the uh, the skeletal anatomy, but I would expect him to withhold his opinion until he educated himself on the uh, biomechanics underlying his his supposition. But it's you know I'm very very confident in my interpretation, uh, uh, both because of the repeated corroboration with other examples, but also because I can actually watch the dynamic unfold on the film the video yeah see the movement of the foot i can see the flexion and so forth that, that accounts for i said what really uh sealed the deal for me though was when i went to china and there in china had the opportunity to to meet a, a witness who had uh the wherewithal to make a, a pair of casts of the footprints left by the creature that he had witnessed, that he had encountered in the Shenanjian Nature Reserve. And, you know, it was, it, was, it was quite dramatic because they wouldn't let me see them until they were ready to roll for the interview. They wanted to capture that first impression. And I had a little, a little bit of a, of a spoiler because I had given, I gave Mr. Yuan, as we're on the bus going out to the site, the location they had chosen to do to set up for the interview, I gave Mr. Yuan, the, the witness, uh, a reprint of the paper, the Ichno Taxonomy paper, which was very profusely illustrated and showed this, this very dramatic figure with 3D scans of that uh, very pronounced pressure ridge in the cast made by Bob Titmus, showing it from three points of view. He couldn't read the English, he couldn't speak English, but boy, he saw that, he opens it up and he sees that illustration. And oh, he just sat up in his chair, grabbed my shirt, my or my uh, jacket sleeve, and he's pulling on and he's thumping on the illustration. And I said, okay, I get it, I get it, okay, okay. So we get there and he opens up his little suitcase and out comes the toweling and out comes this pair of footprints and they were dead ringers. Wow. I mean, this this thing was had a maybe a, another half inch or three quarters inch breadth 
So maybe it was a young male instead of a female like Patty. But, um, but I mean, the, the shape and proportions, the orientation and position of the pressure ridge uh, was just identical. And this, the, the circumstances were, were such, it, it had squatted down presumably at a, at a spring on a muddy bank. And so in squatting, the foot had, the heel had come up and the weight was differentially over the fore part of the foot and it created push the push back into the heel imprint. And how could this guy have done this? I mean, well, I mean, what are the odds? Where, where did, he couldn't speak English. He didn't even know about Sasquatch through the interpreter. He asked me at one point. So is there anything like, is there anything like the wild man, the Yaron? Is there anything like this in America? I go, uh, yeah, there, we, we think there is. <laughs> That's why we're, why we're here. You know, 48 or 50 states. Uh, uh, we've, we've had sightings just about 47 or so. Um, okay, so here's what we got. So we got about 23 minutes left. We're gonna go to Tim. First of all, welcome Tim, uh, the the co-host of Bigfoot Influencers Party. People, put those hands together. Thank you, thank you, and Dr. Jeff, my friend, how are you? Good, thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. So uh, I've got a question that I've never asked you before, which is rare because I've badgered you with questions. Uh -huh. uh, ba based on the Patterson Gimlin film. Well, has anyone been accurately been able to determine the shoulder width? And if it's out of human range, wouldn't that be yeah. pretty much rule out of hoax? Yeah, yeah, this is interesting. Um, uh, the the uh, most detailed assessment of the proportions was carried out by John Green. So very early on, he did a whole series of tracings of enlargements of the frame so this was from the original you know and from those tracings using the foot as the scale uh, of 14 and a half inches now there's there's a little room for as with many people uh one foot is slightly longer than the other uh so you, you always hear 14 and a half inches but and that is her and i have to always picture this that is her right foot the left foot I would be more comfortable uh, labeling it as 15 inches. You know, you always have to be careful because I mean, we're dealing with footprints, right? And there, and the depth of the imprint and other distortions, the way the toes are, are lifted out and so forth can add a quarter inch, a half inch easier. But anyway, using that as the scale, we then determined her proportions. And yes, her shoulder breadth, uh, I mean, it was, uh, was, close to 36 inches if i remember i'd have to look down again 36 or 42 inches across now i'm i am seeing i'm all these numbers have just gone out of my head because i'm i'm just about six foot i have fairly broad shoulders but my shoulders the last time i measured them i think were it was only like 27 inches across so you can imagine something that's another six inches maybe a foot taller than me but then with shoulders that are a full uh, 10 to 16 inches uh, wider than my shoulders. So it's, it was, this was a, an interesting thing came up and, and uh, um, have a, a, a real uh, tension between uh, a former colleague. And I, ne I don't know who you were talking uh, in, before the show about my uh, roommate. Uh, oh, do Dr. Simeon Hine. Oh, I'll, I'll have to read his okay, uh, what yeah. the text said, and okay. then I'll read back to you. Yeah. Well, uh, for a long time, people thought that, that David Daglin and I were roommates at Stony Brook. It was a one. cousin Daniel at Yale. It was his cousin Daniel. Oh, oh, Daniel, yeah. Daniel at Yale. You went to Yale? No, I didn't go to Yale. <laughs> oh, he must have you confused with somebody else then. Yeah, it might be there, there it might a be a different Jeff Kripal instead of Jeff Meldrum, yeah. two PhDs. Go ahead. <laughs> In any case, so so uh, David Daglin made a big deal. Grover Krantz had had asserted that there wasn't a human alive that could fill the proportions of that cost if it were a costume that could fill the proportions. And um, uh, Daglin, in his book, takes and in a in a previously um, published article, which I reviewed. Uh, he took Grant Krantz to task. He re referred to some some um, anthropometric manuals 
where they have these huge data sets that are gleaned from lots and lots of army recruits. And there are different nations, there's American and German and so forth, uh, you know, various NATO nations that make their data available. And um, one of the measures had to do with the chest, not the shoulders, but the chest. And um, uh, Daglin cited one of these anthropometric uh, values as uh, that showing that humans um, were big enough to fill that. Well, what he chose was the um, intersky, um, which is called, uh, which is a measure uh, not of just of chest, chest breadth, but the surface measure across the chest from the center of the armpit, one armpit across the front of the chest, you know, a taped measure across the surface to the other armpit, which obviously is much more than is the, show the chest breadth measure. And I pointed this and he had conflated those two. There's, they're not comparable in the least. I mean, one can be 20 to 30% more than uh, the other, the, the taped measure across, you know, it's essentially a hemispheric, a half a circumference of the chest, basically, instead of the diameter, you know, you would never equate those two. And he wouldn't back down. He wouldn't correct it. He wouldn't retract that. And then he went and republished it in his, with even more exposition in his book. And, and you know, lambasted Krantz as, as not knowing his trade, his craft. And, and it was, you know, the opposite was true. So that, like you, as you, you, as you point out, if you've got that breadth, then how, you know, you can't have your arms swing. It's like when you put on a, parka that's too big and your arms are out here it's like that uh, christmas story image of the little kid all wrapped up to go to school and his arms are sticking out the sides and he can't put his arms down <laughs> that's what it would be like if you were in the costume and so they say oh well then you could stick your elbows right in the shoulders and then just have extensions your, your wrist would be would be the um costume elbow and you would have an extension that went down to the hand well, unfortunately, that makes the shoulders breadth too great. You know, you can't, you, know, you, you can't break bones to uh, split the difference. And, and we can see movements in the fingers. We can see when you extend the wrist, it caused the tension in the flexors muscles cause the uh, fingers to flex. They're extended. And then when the wrist goes up, the fingers flex naturally, but passively. So that wouldn't be built into a costume like that if you just had a, a, a broomstick. You know, Morris, Philip Morris even argued that he explained how Roger could extend the arm length by having the person in the costume hold a, a sawed off broomstick that stuck into the hand, stuffed the hand with, with paper or something and then just stick the broomstick, you know, and then I guess hope that it doesn't slip off the end is, during the middle of your your shoot but that doesn't th then your forearm is way too long by comparison to the upper arm and her proportions are are reasonable compared to other um other primates and humans so all right um so we've got about 15 minutes left so we want to go quick hitters on this uh this final round that we're going to do jeff uh nathan what i was going to tell alexander uh, more than this there. We we don't know uh, if President Roosevelt knew about the Bigfoot connection. There's no way that that uh, we could know that is possible. It, it, it is a, a conspiracy theory that's popular. It's possible that he knew and, and perhaps he didn't know. Um, and as the other question about the weaponization of Bigfoot, again, that's something that nobody here could speak to. All right. Uh, so, Dr. Jeff, I, I've discussed this hypothesis with a couple of researchers um, a researcher who wanted to remain nameless actually told me that that this happened to him and it was corroborated by another field researcher that was with him. This is somebody with um, multiple decades in it, someone that, that, that I think is trustworthy. Uh, I discussed this with Tim. So let me ask you this. Do you believe in homes that their people have experienced ghosts of some sort? Do you believe that? You know, I, I don't really have a, 
an opinion uh, as to um, the role of or the existence of ghosts or spirits. I've never had any personal experiences that would that would um, you know give substance to an opinion yeah. like that. But uh, it's within the realm of possibility. You would sure. Oh yeah. Okay. I don't. I, I don't rule out the fact that, or the possibility, not the fact. Rule out the possibility that there could be other dimensions and other okay, other forms of. Existence. So so what I was trying to come up with, I heard someone famous in the, in the Bigfoot community posit this theory, and I don't want to say his name because I don't want to color what your response would be by the individual's name. But then I checked it out by checking with some other people about this. But we don't. You know, nobody can prove about a parent necessarily a paranormal aspect of Bigfoot. People have said they have seen them do things. They have heard them walk up to a tent, but then they could they never heard them walk away, or they didn't hear them walk up, but then they did hear them walk away. These types of things. Sure. So what I'm think if if humans, it's possible that humans are are remaining in a location as a distressed spirit, as a replayed memory, as a ghost that people experience in their homes. And there's, you know, thousands and thousands of people that, that report that they have had some sort of ghost activity in their home from a traumatic event that occurred in that home. So if there are some inexplicable events in the woods with Bigfoot, is it possible that it's nothing more than one that died? That, that it's, it's a ghost of an animal that lived there? a living, breathing animal that died and then is now replaying something. It may have had a traumatic event there. It may have loved that space. Who knows? For the same reasons that spirits don't, uh, can't somehow um, extricate themselves, you know, from a, from a location. Is it possible that that's happened with a Bigfoot? And it would explain something that looks like a portal, but it's not. It's actually just a ghost that's appearing and then disappearing. Sure. As they do. Yeah. Well, I mean, never say never, right? I, 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 uh, I have no way to evaluate that, and and that's the only uh, restriction or, or self limiting principle that I adhere to. Because I, you know, I am trained as a scientist. I have, mm -hmm. I have other interests, obviously, as well, and and certainly entertain broader. Um, uh, panoramas of possibilities but uh as, as a scientist as an investigator i'm going to hold myself to very uh rigid standards rigorous of yeah, and, yeah. And, so, and i and so if someone wants to promulgate a, a, a notion uh beyond just simply sharing a personal experience then, then they are beholding to those uh, those same standards of, of of evidence, I think. And so, you know, when it comes, especially when it comes to Bigfoot, uh, some of the claims that people put out there, it's like I said, I've often taken people up on their invitation to come out and try to experience those things with them. And when I come along, suddenly these uh, wild uh, experiences that they've described fail to occur they don't happen I, I guess i'm the the wet blanket at the party you know i'm not I'm the party pooper but <laughs> and and other people who have who i have pressed to um substantiate their experience photographically or otherwise you know they'll they'll bring forth a photograph there was one just recently he was going on and on about all these orbs that he was experiencing when he was out mm -hmm looking for Bigfoot. And I said, well, can, you know, do you have any pictures? And uh, in this case, he, he said, oh, yeah, I do. I said, well, will you share what you think is your best, most convincing photograph? So I get <laughs> yes. this I get this photograph, and it's a, it's a flash uh, picture taken at night. And he was apparently camped under all these big ponderosa pines that were in full pollination. If you've ever seen this, it's like a blizzard. And yeah. you see a flash picture... And it just is almost a whiteout. And I right. said, well, you know, just to make sure we're on the same page, these are orbs. Yeah, each and every one of these is an orb. It was pollen reflecting the the flash of the camera. And that was, you know, and I, I know other people have had more described, more convincing. I had someone 
uh, as I was sharing this experience with them, they pulled out their phone and here was this little orb right downtown. He was in, in a parked car, angled in with angled parking. So he's looking towards the storefronts and dancing across, you know, just a few feet above the sidewalk is this ball of light. But it looked suspiciously to me like, you know, something that was reflecting off of a, a moving window or a sign or something on the opposite side, because this, our view was in shadow. Uh, the sun was coming over the tops of the buildings and hitting the, the buildings behind. And, and it looked just like, you know, like that reflection off the, we used to take a, one of our CDs. We had a dog who, like, like the cat with the flashlight, we'd, ref, we'd use a CD, catch the sunlight and uh, bounce that across the floor. And man, he'd go crazy. Freak before. him out. Yeah. But it looked just like that. It was just this kind of bouncing along an irregular course. You know, I don't know. I don't know what that was. I, I think it was, you know, a more rational, or not, I shouldn't say more rational. I think it was a simpler explanation than something. Than or, yeah. The, uh, energy the, orb, yeah. the, the ghost hypothesis I found to be it, it's a little more digestible than saying it's a portal to a different dimension. Not to say not to throw cold water on that, but I said, okay, ghosts are something that a lot of us can to use a yeah. word from last week's show, which was used like five times. We can metabolize <laughs> a lot, yeah. a lot easier uh, than than portals and stuff. And basically, to make a long story short, this individual was at the trailhead. They were headed back to the vehicle. And saw what looked like a native, a Native American person, a white person in period clothing, and then a Bigfoot looking at them. That that appeared, and all three of them appeared to be spirit-like. Oh, it didn't. Wow. It wasn't until they got in the car that one of the other researchers said, "Hey, did you see that Indian lady and the and the the, the little girl with her? You know, and she sort oh. of was in a, a a hug from behind." Uh, situation uh -huh. so that's when this person was like okay wow i th you know <laughs> i i think that this is this is a possibility now that's but anyway yeah I've, I've never heard that suggestion that you yeah. know spectral sasquatch uh, ghosts yeah that's i mean so anyway let's yeah. get to uh deb's and we have about we don't have a lot we've got about six minutes left so let's get get deb's and then uh we'll go with uh cabby goodbyes yeah, I just wanted to ask if you think there are any other videos that we should be looking at of um, Bigfoot to kind of analyze. <clears throat> well, one that uh, that I featured in my book, Sasquatch Legend Meets Science, uh, was the Freeman footage uh, shot outside of uh, Walla Walla up near a place called Deduck Springs. And uh, Cliff Berkman has been doing some interesting things uh, trying to, well, he's, he's gone back to the site and, and identified the landmarks. And there's been a few changes, obviously, over the years. But uh, you can quite readily have a person uh, walk that path and put their feet exactly where they should be relative to the image on the, on the uh, video. And uh, it, it makes for a really interesting um, corroboration. I think it's going. They're going to do a more in-depth analysis to include in the sequel, Sasquatch Legend Meets Science Two. So I'll probably be discussing that, uh, highlighting that further in the companion volume that'll be coming out with that. So that's one that, that's still up there. Um, you know, I, I get so many. I get inundated with so many things. Um, it's hard to pick out. Yeah, it's hard to pick out ones, but. Uh, um, one, one that it's always struck my, uh, or piqued my curiosity, but I've never had the chance to delve into it any further is I think it's called the high cliff, uh, video where the fella comes up behind a Sasquatch that's tearing open, uh, a, yes. a, a, a cavity in a cypress tree. And then it stands up and you see it, it looks like you're looking at the back of the head and shoulders of a gorilla. And then it stands up on these long legs. So you get this, you know, from the waist up, it looks like a gorilla, but from the waist down, suddenly here are these long hairy legs and the guy freaks out and runs <laughs> away. <laughs> Understandably, perhaps, but uh, that's one I've always wanted. Apparently the uh, owner is asking a very steep 
licensing fee. So it has not been subjected to further analysis on documentaries or TV shows. And so, you know, that's one step in, uh, I think Thinker Thunker may have broken it down at some point um, uh, favorably. Uh, if nothing else, the scale uh, would suggest something that's really quite large based on the size of the of the cypress trunk uh, that he's uh, working on there that video is scary man because you're like i need to get up out of here because it's like there's an <laughs> anger associated with it yeah, yeah. all right um let's go with uh cabbie goodbyes uh tim since you're cabbie today you can say goodbye to dr jeff first all right well dr jeff I actually i want to i want to suggest for the audience you know make sure you go to the relic hominoid inquiry yes uh, got it if if you haven't read Je dr jeff's book it, it's 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 a must whether whatever you feel you believe after you read it that's up to you but you got to start there so and i just hey i appreciate everything you do for the community dr jeff and uh, we'll, we'll chat with you real soon okay very good thank you debs I just wanted to say thank you so much for bringing science into this topic. We hope more scientists will come on board um, with all of these topics and continue to apply the scientific method and credibility to these topics that are touching everybody so much. Sure. Thanks. Appreciate that. Money. Uh, yeah, Dr. Meldrum, it is uh, refreshing to see your enthusiasm uh, still going strong for this topic in uh, nearly three decades, right? So yeah. it's uh, absolutely incredible. I could listen to you talk about this all day long. I wish I were in one of your classes. I bet it would be fascinating. So uh, thank you for uh, spending some time with us and, and educating us on this tonight. It's been really, really amazing. And um, we look forward to, to the next book. Well, good. Thanks. Nathan, it's not too late. He might have some openings next semester. So there you go. <laughs> Yeah. He's a student from North Carolina. Um, yeah, I was going to say Legend Meet Science is the book, and it was also a documentary, which I have yet to see. It was in association with uh, Doug, Doug Hycheck, who's going to be a very – he's going to be coming up soon, I think, in August on uh, CAB as well. We're looking forward to that. And the, the, so there's going to be a second documentary uh, is what you're talking about. That was greenlit. Am I correct? Yes, yes. He's begun filming, and so it'll be – It'll be interesting to extend. We've now been, what, 17, 17 plus years. Well, my book came out in uh, 2006. So yeah. things that have developed, as well as new lines of evidence, new, uh, new inquiry, uh, but also extending kind of the threads of, um, of evidence from the first uh, edition. Before, hey, Jeff, before we go, before I, I, there's one more thing I want to ask real quick. Um, if you were to characterize your uh, whole experience out there in the Canadian uh, Rockies with uh, with uh, Todd Standing, uh, that experience, it, could you just characterize that real quick? Well, it, it was a real positive experience. You know, I, I went with an open mind and uh, uh, as his guest and his at his invitation, and I thought this would be a, a great chance to see that part of the country and and get to know him as well as look more closely. Um, I didn't wasn't afforded as much time to really delve into his evidence, uh, the the videographic evidence, mm -hmm. the photographic evidence, uh, as I would have liked to have. But but the the four or five days I spent in the field with him were 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 really amazing. And uh, you know we hiked all all over the place and saw footprints, saw thirteen and a half inch, fourteen inch footprints in the moss. We had baits taken, then we had the camp visited. I mean, all those experiences were. They unfolded as you see it on the video. He did a good job. He, he stuck to the facts. And, uh, uh, you know, sometimes he shoots himself in the foot a little bit. He's his own worst enemy because he's he's almost too bombastic. Sure, and, sure. Uh, and I try to get him to focus. I try to get him to realize that he needs to make his case, not not try to sell it. Look, Because it comes across like he's trying to bamboozle and, uh, and you know, get one by. And... Um, I don't know. I, I have serious reservations about some of the photographic evidence. Mm -hmm. um, it's I must say it's not what I expect. You know, when you're when you've got the Patterson Gimlin film and it seems so consistent 
with and the, there's there's some of his things that he portrays, but I, you know the close up facials, uh, especially the first two, mm-hmm. are are uh, seem un- very anomalous. They don't <laughs> seem they don't seem you know right what I would expect. And but on the other hand, some of the criticism this is you know I always try to because some Balance. of the criticisms that were were weighed or, or leveled rather against it were kind of baseless and it was very easy to find counter examples that supported the image rather than detracted from it and um, so you know there were some some things yeah anyway yeah there's so a, there... it's hard to make a short give a short answer <laughs> I tend to, see to ramble a little bit you know I, I we appreciate it. We we learned a lot, and we would love to have you back on again because I certainly have more questions about the things that really intrigue you uh, beyond just the the actual part of that that have to do with uh, your area of expertise, but the, just uh, that your knowledge of different narratives writ large and things that that you've come to know and learn. Um, so thank you very much on behalf of everybody here, Tim, Deb, Nathan. This is DJ and Calling All Beings. Thank you, Dr. Meldrum. We're saying peace out. One love. We'll see you down the road. And as always, we wonder what's up around the bend. Yep. Thanks.